When I wrote the foregoing update in 1986, I never expected to hear from Ted again. Shortly after I mailed my update manuscript, the letter I had sent to Ted in prison was returned marked refused. I was not surprised. I assumed that Ted was still very angry with me. By refusing to even open my letter, he was letting me know that he no longer had any interest in my opinions. So be it. I tossed the still unopened letter into the drawer. Ted certainly was within his rights to remain annoyed with me. I don't know what made me pick that letter up, weeks later, and stare at it. As I did, I detected an almost invisible strip of cellophane tape along the top of the envelope. Curious, I looked closer. The letter had been opened, but then somebody had obviously resealed it. Had Ted been curious to see what I had to say, only to reseal my letter and mark it refused? I peeled the tape off and looked inside. There was an institutional form letter tucked into my stationery. It read, Reason for refusal, contraband. See item checked below. What possible contraband could I have sent to Ted? I saw that cash or personal check had been marked. A notation stipulated that only money orders could be sent to prisoners. I had sent Ted a small check to buy cigarettes, along with some stamps. He was facing the electric chair in the immediate future, or so it seemed. Money for cigarettes seemed a humane gesture, but my check had made my letter unacceptable at the Rayford prison. Maybe they had too many bad checks in the Florida State Prison mailroom, and the prisoner's commissary had been stuck with them. The question of whether Ted would read my letter was still open. With nothing to lose, I tried one more time to reach him. Time was growing short. I replaced the check with a money order and resent the letter. He answered. Indeed, Ted answered my letter on March 5, 1986. He was to have died the day before. His life was measured now in such short increments of time. Although I am skeptical of what can be read into our handwriting, and because of the sheer number of requests, have long ago had to stop sending samples of my subject's writing to graph analysts, I must admit that I could see a rather profound change in Ted's writing. I had not had a letter from him since 1980. In six years, during which he was locked in a single cell in death row, Ted's hand had become even more cramped than before, with letters being pushed together like the shoulders of too many men scrunched tight in a small space. The first letter of what would prove to be a handful of classic study and passive aggression. I had written to try to explain to Ted what I knew was unexplainable. I wanted him to know that his death would not go unnoticed, or completely unmourned, by me. I had tried to say all that, without really saying it, not writing the words that seemed apparent, now that you're about to die. In Ted's reply, he thanked me politely for the stamps I'd sent. He then set about putting me in my place, slapping me down verbally, while still appearing above it all. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing to be gained by trying to sort through a lot of faded memories about what did and did not transpire between us. But your book, but your numerous public statements on serial murder, that's water under the bridge. I have other matters to deal with. In all candor, I must say this much to you, Anne. Judging from the statements I've heard and read about you making on serial murder, I suggest you seriously reevaluate the opinions and conclusions you've formed. For whatever reason, you seem to have adopted a number of oversimplified, overgeneralized, and scientifically unsupportable views on the subject. The net result of this is that by disseminating such views, no matter how well intended you are, you will only succeed in misleading people about the true nature of the problem, and thereby make them less able to effectively deal with it. Ted continued by saying that he wouldn't mind talking to me again, for the sake of talking, but that he would not contribute to any more books about Ted Bundy. He ended his first short letter, I have no animosity towards you. I know you to be an essentially good person and I wish you the best. Take care. Peace, Ted. His style had grown ponderous and self-conscious. Locked up, virtually powerless at last, it was desperately important for Ted's self-esteem that he be the best at something. All he knew was serial murder, and I had trampled on his territory. Anyone interested in the problem of serial murder undoubtedly had heard my views on the subject. At the invitation of Pierce R. Brooks, former captain of homicide in the Los Angeles Police Department, and the creative mind behind the VICAP, Violent Criminal Apprehension Program Task Force, I had joined the group in 1982 as one of the five civilian advisors. Ted was only one of many, many serial killers I had written about, but it was the Ted case that was slated to be the prototype for the VICAP program. The clever, 
charismatic, roving killer. I presented my four-hour slide seminar on Bundy to the task force at the same Houston State University in Huntsville, Texas. Brooks believed that a central computerized tracking system could cut short the killing careers of serial killers who stalked America. So did representatives from the U.S. Department of Justice, the FBI, and state, county, and local law enforcement agencies. After years of work and lobbying, VICAP became a reality in June 1985 in Quantico, Virginia, where it was linked to the FBI's National Crime Information Center's computers. No longer could killers such as Ted Bundy travel and kill with impunity. VICAP followed them as they left a scarlet trail across America, and VICAP would be instrumental in stopping them before that trail became tragically long and convoluted. I often spoke on the need for the VICAP system, testified before a U.S. Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Serial Murder, and had become a certified instructor for law enforcement, probation, parole, and corrections officers in both Oregon and California. I spoke not only on serial murder, but on victimology and on women who killed. Ted and I were each so far removed from our nights at the crisis clinic 15 years behind us now. I thought I'd detected a faint sound of a gauntlet being thrown down. He fancied himself the definitive expert on serial murder, and he was telling me that I was simplistic and misinformed. I was perfectly willing for Ted to find me inept, if it meant that he might open up. Ted Bundy might well be the all-time champion expert on serial murder. I was more than happy to listen. I wrote him a letter on March 13, 1986. In it, I listed my assessment of characteristics serial killers appeared to have in common, noting that it was impossible to line up serial killers in a row like so many ducks. My overview was only a general guideline, I stressed, drawn from commonalities I windowed out of the life stories of a number of killers who seemed to fit. I asked him to point out the areas where he found my reasonings and conclusions off base. To Ted, I wrote that I found serial killers were exclusively male, more likely to be Caucasian than black, and very rarely Indian or Oriental, brilliant, charming, and charismatic, physically attractive, hands-on killers who use their hands as a weapon to bludgeon, choke, strangle, or knife victims, killers who seldom used a gun, with the exception of David Berkowitz and Randy Woodfield, Travelers, men who moved constantly either around the city where they lived or around the country, trolling for victims, putting many times the mileage on their vehicles than ordinary men did. Men who were full of rage, who killed to take the edge off that rage, and who employed sex in their murder scenario principally to demean their victims. Men addicted to murder, as an addict is addicted to drugs or liquor. Men who were fascinated by police work, who either spend time hanging around the police station or who actually work as reserve officers or commissioned policemen. Men who seek a particular type of victim. Women, children, vagrants, the elderly, homosexuals, vulnerable victims. Men who employed a ruse or a device to lure their victims away from help. Men who had suffered from some kind of child abuse under the age of five. I believed serial killers were very bright, sensitive children who were abused, abandoned, humiliated, rejected, during the time when their consciences should have been developing. It was a risky ploy, and I knew that I was right on the edge of offending Ted, angering him to the point that he would not respond. I explained that I felt that serial killers could not voluntarily stop killing, and that they stopped only when they were no longer able to overpower victims, or when they were in prison or dead. I was telling him exactly what I had told classes I spoke to, and what I had said on television dozens of times. I was most curious to hear what Ted had to say about serial killers, just as other experts in this criminal aberration were. Ted Bundy was a gold mine of a sort. I had always believed that he had some kind of cogent answers to the growing problem locked up inside him. If he chose to, he still had the capability to do a modicum of good in the world, if only by admitting his badness and offering help to criminologists, psychiatrists, and psychologists who were trying to staunch the flow of more Ted's. He was not ready to do that. Yet. Once again, I waited for a response to my letter. There was none. Either I had finally alienated him, or he was too busy to reply. He was busy. He could pick and choose whom he might favor with his knowledge and philosophy. Everyone from Connie Chung to 2020 to People Magazine to 60 Minutes and on down an endless media list who had sought an audience with Ted. From his cell, Ted announced he would grant an interview to the most prestigious in his mind, 
the New York Times. While a Florida official commented that Ted was playing a very dangerous game with his gambles to defeat the process. Even a lot of anti-death penalty people don't lose sleep over his case. Ted calmly spoke to the Times. He was, as he was with me, above it all. If anyone considers me a monster, that's just something they'll have to confront in themselves. It has nothing to do with me because they don't know me. If they really knew me, they would discover I'm not a monster. For that matter, for people to condemn someone, to dehumanize someone like me, is a very popular and effective way of dealing with a fear and a threat that is just incomprehensible. It's sort of like the old cliché of the ostrich sticking its head in the sand. When people go to those clichés that someone is a monster beyond help, that he's demented, that he's got some kind of defect, then they're sticking their heads in the ground out of ignorance. Like so many other serial killers, Ted needed to be considered a normal person. He did not want to be thought a pervert, so full of defect that one wondered how he kept his mind marginally intact. He certainly did not want to be seen as a monster. And like any number of sociopaths I have listened to, Ted so often spoke in clichés, even as he derided them. Water under the bridge, stick its head in the sand. The clichés seem to give a sociopath something to cling to, a verbal anchoring place that allows him to communicate, to speak the language of normal people. Ted did not want to be seen as a monster, and I strived, as I always had, to see Ted as something other than a monster. That was the only way I could write to him. My intellect clung tenaciously to monster, but working on sheer emotion, I wondered if there might not be some recessed part of him with a vestigial conscience. That was why I wanted the dialogue with him. As many times as I told myself Ted Bundy was a monster, as many times as I told others the same thing, it was still the hardest thing for me to believe. Not only about Ted. My work placed me next to so many monsters. After almost two decades of writing about sadistic sociopaths, I still found it well-nigh impossible to grasp emotionally that there were those of my own species who truly felt no speck of compassion or empathy for another's pain. I cannot step on a spider. I couldn't swat a fly until I became a mother and one too many landed on my baby. How could someone torture and kill an innocent victim and not feel remorse? Was that what I wanted Ted Bundy to tell me? Did I want him to say, after so many years, that yes, he did feel bad? That he did spend sleepless nights thinking about his victims? And if he did say, or write the words, could I believe him? Spring of 1986. In six months, Ted would be 40, if he lived that long. It looked as if he would. Polly Nelson took an appeal all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Ted was asking for a new trial in the Kyle Mega cases based, again, on the fact that eyewitness Nita Neary had been hypnotized to help her remember. On May 5, 1986, the court turned the appeal down. The High Court denied Ted's appeal 7-2 with no comment. Justices William Brennan and Thurgood Marshall dissented, adhering to their long-held opposition to the death penalty. A spokesman for Florida Governor Bob Graham said that the governor would probably sign a new warrant immediately for Ted's execution. The timing was all showbiz perfection. The court's answer was announced during a break in a two-part miniseries about Ted. Mark Harmon, People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive, played Ted as Ted was betrayed in Richmond Larson's book The Deliberate Stranger. Physically, Harmon was a good choice, but he played Ted Bundy as a confidant from the beginning, as a young Kennedy clone. To Harmon's credit, he could not have known that Ted Bundy had begun his twenties as the man I knew, the socially inept man, the man who felt he didn't fit into a world of wealth and success. It was the latter day in famous Ted who was smooth and charismatic. Infamy became Ted. Only as his crimes made black headlines did he become the Ted Bundy portrayed by Mark Harmon. That one-dimensional man was the Hollywood TV Ted. Harmon's Ted was so charming and sexy that he sometimes seemed almost heroic. And that was the Ted that a whole new generation of teenage girls fell in love with. I was appalled at the letters and phone calls I got from young girls who wanted to rush to Florida to save Ted Bundy. Finally, I said, or wrote, firmly to each one, You are not in love with Ted Bundy. You are in love with Mark Harmon. I was gratified when several girls responded, You know, you're right. I got carried away seeing Mark Harmon. Ted's latest day of execution had expired on May 6th. 
but Polly Nelson announced that she would continue the fight to save his life on two fronts. She would protest the Supreme Court's decision, arguing that they had not properly dismissed the appeal on its merits, and she would file a new appeal with the Supreme Court in the case of the murder of Kimberly Leach. While Polly Nelson scrambled for legal footing, Governor Graham set a new execution date, July 2, 1986. The word was that this would be it. Ted had slid by on his first warrant, but this was the second. Ted was scheduled to die at 7 a.m. on the first Wednesday in July, and all of Polly Nelson's determined efforts to save him might not be able to stop his inexorable progression towards Old Sparky, the electric chair. While Nelson's fight was slated towards appealing the conviction, she admitted that she was willing to try any avenue to spare Ted, even an insanity defense. Would Ted cooperate in such a defense? He has always been so rational, so determined to be rational. I had always believed he would literally rather die than admit to any weakness of mind, any aberrance. Ted was so dedicated to being sane, to give up his sanity, even to live, might not be worth it. But Polly Nelson and James E. Coleman, Jr. began to make noises about the sanity issue. Coleman, a personable, brilliant, young black attorney, tentatively tested the waters. He suggested that Ted's competency was an area that had never been fully explored. Coleman said that the only attorney who had believed that Ted was incompetent, Mike Minerva, had been prevented from participating in Ted's competency hearing way back in the spring of 1979. Ted, of course, had torn up the agreement that would have plea bargained him into three consecutive 25-year terms. In effect, Ted had chosen the very real threat of death by execution rather than admit that he was less than competent. Coleman believed that Ted was his own worst enemy. By insisting on running the show, Ted had set himself on this deadly path. Coleman argued that Ted, only a second-year law student, had frequently tried to direct his own defense, demanding that his attorneys be replaced and unknowingly undermining his right to effective representation. Mr. Bundy was represented by a total of 14 lawyers, Coleman said. He was also represented by himself. We think he was denied effective counsel. Could Coleman and Nelson now convince an appeals court that Ted Bundy was crazy? You cannot execute a crazy man, even if his descent into madness had occurred while he waited on death row. Vic Africano, Ted's defense attorney in the Kimberly Leach case, believed that Ted was a split personality. In all the time I was with Ted Bundy, I never saw anything that would indicate he could commit these crimes, Africano reflected in June of 1986. But then again, neither did I. Ted kept that side of himself hidden. Bob Deckel, the prosecutor in the Leach trial, had a blunter, less charitable opinion. He saw Ted differently. He had seen too many sociopaths in his career to believe the mask. A sociopath is a person who, if you sit down and talk to that person, you would like him. And the longer you listen to him, he tells you about how society, how everybody's out to get him. You start to believe him. At times, Bundy had me believing him. But he's just another sociopath, except he has a pretty face. It looked as if it was really coming down. The death watch began in Stark, Florida. Nelson and Coleman filed appeals, requests for clemency hearings and stays of execution. Each was refused. Ted and Gerald Stano, 34, also linked to dozens of sex slayings of young women, were scheduled to die, in tandem as it were, two days before Independence Day. I believe that Ted was going to die this time. I was so sure of it that I somewhat naively attempted to phone him. Personal phone calls are not favored in Rayford Prison. However, Superintendent Duggar's office did assure me that they would pass on the word to Ted that I had called. Carol Ann Boone was there for Ted, as loyal and faithful as always. She and her son, Jamie Boone, spent the waiting hours with Ted whenever they were allowed. Carol Ann, an unwilling subject caught by the cameras, was much thinner than she had been at Ted's 1979 trial, and she was blonde rather than brunette. She looked so different that she almost seemed to have taken on her husband's chameleon-like aspect. Early on Tuesday, July 1st, Carol Ann, Jamie, and Rose, Ted and Carol Ann's four-and-a-half-year-old daughter, visited in a sealed visitor's room. Carol Ann left Rayford Prison shortly after noon, holding a green plastic trash bag over her head. Jamie guarded her protectively, shouting, Shut up! Shut up! to the reporters who called out questions. Ted moved to a holding cell, the last step before the walk to the death chamber did not portray fear. 
except his eyes. There was something about his eyes, one guard said, that made you wonder if he was getting frightened. Ted ate his breakfast of oatmeal and hotcakes. The guards watched over him, careful that he would not commit suicide and cheat the electric chair. He had no reason to do that. Maybe Ted sensed that this wasn't the time. Both he and Gerald Stano were given first a 24-hour reprieve, and then an indefinite stay of execution. Ted had come within 15 hours of dying, and he never spoke of fear. He never let them see so much as a quiver of his jaw muscle. His dignity intact, Ted moved from the holding cell back to his regular cell on death row. All the machinations of his attorneys and the courts had, once again, ended in a delay. While U.S. District Judge William Zulk of Fort Lauderdale rejected a petition from Ted's attorneys challenging Ted's murder conviction in the Kyle Mugga cases, Nelson and Coleman appealed to the 11th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals in Atlanta. A three-judge panel would evaluate Zulk's decision and the appeal. That could take months, and some said it might take years. It began to look as though it would be impossible to execute Ted Bundy. He was beating the system, and the taxpayers of Florida were paying for it. On August 4th, Ted wrote to me again in response to the letter I'd sent him in March. His writing looked more out of control than I'd ever seen it, staggering over the pages up and down, words crossed out, overwrites. He was safe for a while, but his writing didn't show that. I received the message you sent through Superintendent Duggar. Thank you very much, and thank you for the money and stamps you sent back in April. Now that things have calmed down some, I can concentrate on doing some letter writing. The niceties dispensed with, Ted started in once more on my general ineptitude in understanding serial murder. He found me sincere, but trapped and limited. You simply don't have a broad and complete enough database to be making such judgments, he chided. The best thing I can do for you is refer you to the summary of the findings of a study done through the Behavioral Sciences Unit and reported in the August 1985 edition of the FBI Bulletin. General, though, the report is, it is by far the best and most accurate study in the area I've seen, and I've seen many. It is only a beginning, but a solid beginning. The FBI once overrated bastards to Ted, now almost had his stamp of approval. I had the FBI bulletin Ted referred to, and I knew two of the contributors well from the VICAP days. It was an excellent study, a study that has now become a book, Sexual Homicide. Patterns and Motives by Robert K. Ressler, Ann W. Burgess, and John E. Douglas. In his letter, Ted asked me not to put his words into print, and I decided within myself that I would not, as long as he lived and fought his legal battles. He clearly didn't trust me, and mentioned several times that he rarely trusted anyone. He ranted for pages about a man who had given public statements about things Ted allegedly had confessed to him. Ted denied this vociferously. Caught off guard by the deviousness of someone else, Ted was as outraged as I'd ever known him to be. He came on as such a decent, sincere, qualified, academic type, Ted wrote anguished, and turned out to be not only a shallow fraud, but a liar. I don't use that word lightly. It shocked me, really. I've met all kinds of people over the years. X was not the kind I expect to lie as he did. Yet he fabricated things as no one else ever has. So sad, Anne. I never talked with that man about any case in which I was a suspect. Never. I'm no fool. I didn't speculate or do anything along those lines. We talked only in the most general terms. Nothing was tape recorded. I've never had anyone lie to me like that before. Not even a cop. It's like open season on Ted Bundy. Anyone can say anything about Ted Bundy, and people will believe it as long as it fits the popular myth. Ted was hoist in his own batard, but he was right in his assessment. Ted asked me to write and to send money and stamps. There's no way my family can help me now. Be good. Peace, Ted. I answered that letter, and a month later he answered me. It was to be his last letter to me. It was friendlier than the first two of this trio of letters from him. Letters written after a space of seven years. He talked about my having a word processor to write with, and said he wouldn't mind having one himself even though it sounded so primarily mechanical. The bulk of his letter, the central part of it, perhaps the reason for the letter itself, 
was about the unsolved Green River murder cases in the Seattle area. Seven years after Ted was arrested in Salt Lake City, the most prolific serial killer to date in America began in a terrible pattern. At least four dozen, and probably twice that many, young street girls, strawberries and street lingo for baby prostitutes, had been murdered, and their bodies left in clusters in wooden areas near both Seattle and Portland. Three thousand miles away, Ted had theories. It would seem that this case is about as cold as such a case can be. The folks at the task force must be spinning their investigative wheels. The way the person responsible dropped out of sight is truly fascinating. Of course, who knows, he may well be dead. There's just no telling. I've accumulated quite a lot of material on this case, and developed many observations about it. A couple of times I've been tempted to express my views about the case. The public has been misled about the case. Public posturing by police officials is understandable, but keeping the people ignorant about the essential nature of such crimes will in the end make a solution even less likely. And despite their best efforts, I can see that the investigators were limited by conventional concepts in an unconventional case. Anyway, I thought of making public my specific observations and ideas, but decided people weren't ready to accept my statements at face value. I didn't need the publicity anyway. I had written to Ted about the scores of women who had contacted me about their encounters with him, although I didn't give specific times, names, or places. I commented that he would have to have been superhuman to have been everywhere people remembered him. There had been a flurry in the press when campers found a tree in San Pete County, Utah, with Ted Bundy's name carved on it, and the date 78. I, too, am familiar with the phenomena of Ted Bundy sightings, he wrote. Tells you a lot about the reliability of eyewitness identification, doesn't it? The Utah authorities know very well that I wasn't in Utah in 1978. There is probably nothing more certain than my whereabouts in 1978. And yet the Utah police act out their little farce. I believe it was done to assure people that the police are still actively investigating the case. I can't say why exactly. Is this an election year? His humor was still caustic. I had asked Ted if he wanted something to read, and he explained that he could not receive books, even directly from the publisher. The exceptions were religious books, or books that came in one of four package permits a year, but Ted had used all of his permits in 1986. I had asked him, too, if he was busy working on his case, and he explained that he no longer concerned himself with legal pursuits. I leave that all to my attorneys now. I don't find legal work to be a positive, uplifting experience for me, to say the least. Now that I have attorneys who have the ability and resources to handle the cases, I keep my involvement to a minimum. I have other things to do. He did not say what those other things were. Write soon. Be good. Peace, Ted. I never heard from him again. I am sure that I wrote back to him. But then the fall of 1986 was the beginning of a frenetic two years for me. I was finishing up my book on Dane Downs, Small Sacrifices, lecturing in California, and preparing for a month-long publicity tour. That tour would somehow never slow down between the hardcover and the paperback editions of Small Sacrifices, and I seemed to be running faster and faster. With Ted, there always seemed to be time. His life was like the perils of Pauline. Something always saved him in the final hour, and I always thought I would write to him again and see if he would answer. And I always wondered if maybe someday he would tell me the truth, or truths, he kept hidden so well. Ted had written that he no longer indulged in the semi-practice of criminal law, that he had other things to do. I suspect that a voluminous correspondence system took much of Ted's days. I was to learn that Ted wrote to many, many people, including women all over America. To those I have talked with, he wrote of his need for stamps, money orders, and research. He answered an eloquent, poetic letter from a man who had grown up in Tacoma at the same time Ted did. The man was a gentle soul, a lover of animals, who lived on an island in Puget Sound. He was also a talented writer of nostalgia, and I cannot imagine that Ted could resist the letters that must have evoked bittersweet memories of his own youth. Ted wrote back, and gradually built a little web, or thought he had. His island correspondent told Ted about himself, about his work, and bells must have rung. 
This man was in a position to provide Ted with information that he had sought for years. Meg's address. Ted's longtime lover had moved often enough so that she had finally freed herself of him, even of his letters. He did not know where she lived, and he wanted to know that. Ted's correspondent worked in personnel. Although his letters sounded guideless, he was very shrewd. He could see Ted's mind working in his letters. He knew his value to Ted was in fact that he could tap a code into a computer and come up with information on Meg. He deduced that Ted wanted to be able to send a letter to Meg's secret address, to say to her in effect, See, you will never be able to hide from me. Even though I'm 3,000 miles away on death row, I have the power to find you. Knowing it would be the end of his correspondence with Ted Bundy, the personnel refused Ted to see intelligence on Meg. Ted never wrote to him again. To a registered nurse in the South, a woman who felt a little sorry for Ted because she had a friend in prison, he explained that his wife had too much to do to run errands for him. He needed information on serial killers, and he needed stamps and a little money. In 1984, unknown to me, Ted also asked the nurse to locate my address. He explained to her that he barely knew me, that I had exploited him, but, for whatever reason, he wanted to find me. I had never changed my mailing address. I still have not. <clears throat> he could have written to me easily, but perhaps he had lost the post office box number. Or more chillingly, he may have wanted to prove that he could find me too. Ted knew that I never revealed my street address. It would have been a subtle psychological ploy if he was able to send a letter directly to my house. By the time I learned he was trying to reach me, I had already written to him. I have no idea what he had in mind in 1984. He never mentioned his search for me in 1984. I could imagine all kinds of things. In reality, I suspect he only wanted times and dates of other serial killers I had written about in the Northwest. He was trying to blame his crimes on other men, and I had all the specifics in my research files. As Ted explained to me at least a dozen women correspondents who contacted me later, he needed help with errands. Carol Ann Boone had run errands for Ted for years without complaint. She was, of course, a very visible presence as he awaited execution in July of 1986. But, so gradually that no one in the media really picked up on it, Carol Ann was slipping out of Ted's life. Unless she chooses to write about her life with Ted one day, or to give interviews, which she has not done for years, no one can do more than speculate on why Carol Ann was seldom there for her bunny. Perhaps the emotional agony she went through in July of 1986, counting down the hours until her husband would die, was too much to go through again. Perhaps the glamour of being in famous defendant's special woman faded to ashes as Carol Ann must have realized that Ted was never going to walk free. Possibly life in Gainesville, Florida, with little money, a toddler, and a teenage to support, surrounded by a palpable hatred for her husband, was all too gritty and real. How many people did Dead Bundy write to? I would guess thousands. A hundred or more people wrote or called me for his address. More often, they must have simply written to him in care of Rayford Prison. One very, very important correspondent was a man who was once anathema to Ted Bundy, and yet it was inevitable that they should come together at some point. Bob Keppel had published the definitive book on an area that interested Ted mightily. Serial Murder, Future Implications for Police Investigations. Ted had written to Keppel in 1984 to offer himself as a consultant in the Green River murder case. It was so typical of Ted's manipulation that he said he might offer to help the task force when he wrote me in 1986. He had been in touch with Keppel for two years by then. Later, Bob Keppel told me that he welcomed Ted's Green River advice. It gave the Washington detective an opening to talk to Ted. If they began talking of Green River, they might also talk about the unsolved cases attributed to Ted Bundy. Although I suspected that Ted and Bob Keppel were in touch with each other in 1986, I wasn't sure. These two men had never met during Keppel's determined investigation into the Ted murders. They had met first in November 1984, in Rayford Prison, and they would meet again. Keppel, the intellectual detective, and Bundy, the intellectual serial killer, were engaged in dialogue. Keppel had been deemed worthy, and Ted was giving his theories to him. I had heard rumors, but I never asked Bob Keppel directly. If he was to get a confession, or a series of confessions, out of Ted Bundy, it was going to be a delicate game, and one that Keppel needed time and discretion to carry out. Bob Keppel and I occasionally had lunch, 
and infrequently I interviewed him for articles about other cases. There were subtle, tantalizing references to Ted, but I didn't pursue them because I could sense the inscrutable couple would climb up. After two decades as a crime writer, I had long since learned to wait until detectives were ready to talk, and Keppel was not ready yet. While Bob Keppel cautiously established some tenuous report with Ted Bundy, the legal mechanisms ground on. It could well be that Keppel might finally come to a place where Ted would talk to him frankly about the Northwest murders, and even more important, the Northwest disappearances, only to run out of time. And yet Keppel knew that Bundy could not be rushed. Anyone who wanted to talk with him must not appear too eager for information. Ted had to call the shots, as galling as that might be for those who waited. On October 21, 1986, Governor Graham signed Ted's third death warrant, setting the next execution date for November 18th for the murder of Kimberly Leach. But three federal appellate judges made it clear on October 23rd that Ted would get another hearing in federal court on the Kyle Mega case. The third judge panel said that Judge William Zalk had erred in not revealing the Bundy trial record before making his decision the previous July to deny the petition of Ted's attorneys. They also told Florida Assistant Attorney General Gregory Costas that he should have asked Zalk to accept the trial record before issuing an opinion. I can't understand your behavior, chided Judge Robert Vance. This case is going to be reversed and sent down there because of a stupid error. If you had called it to the attention of the judge at the time, it could have been corrected in four days. It's wrong. It's clearly wrong, counsel. It's not arguable by an attorney of integrity. That period in July had been wild. Polly Nelson and Jim Coleman had spent consecutive nights without sleep, racing the clock set by Ted's pending death warrant. Zalk, who was considering his first capital punishment appeal since becoming a federal judge in January, had rejected the six-month stay and then had also dismissed Ted's petitions without hearing arguments from attorneys on the issues involved. The trial record remained in the trunk of Greg Costas' car. Costas was shaken by the vehemence of his verbal lambasting by the three-judge panel, and later the judges softened a bit. Vance explained he was simply frustrated by the morass of mistakes he'd seen. Maybe the court has been a little too harsh on you personally, counsel. It was becoming a merry-go-round, when Ted managed to get stays in the Kyomega murders, some legal experts said he could not be executed in the Kimberly Leach murder. Conversely, he would next manage to get a stay on the Leach death warrant, and there was the question of electrocuting him for the sorority murders. He might be able to continue this legal balancing act until he was an old man. Ted didn't die in November 1986, either. Less than seven hours before he was to be executed, the 11th Circuit Court ordered a stay. The Florida Attorney General's office asked the U.S. Supreme Court to overrule that decision. But all the legal jargon really meant only that there would be another delay of many months. Ted's attorneys had now filed 18 different appeals over his two murder convictions in Florida. The appeals were reportedly being paid for by the Washington, D.C. law firm. However, the state of Florida had to pay to argue against all those appeals and delays, and the tab was running into the millions. Florida residents were getting restless. Reader boards read Fried Ted Bundy, and I'll buckle up when Ted Bundy does. Disc jockeys played parodies about Ted. Bye bye, Bundy, bye bye. And I left my life in Rayford Prison. Carol Ann Boone had left her husband in Rayford Prison. Very quietly, she had left town. She was not there with Ted as he awaited death on November 18th. The official reason given to the press was that Carol Ann had left six weeks earlier for Everett, Washington, to visit a sick relative. It would seem that her relative must have been an extremist for Caroline to opt for that visit, rather than stand by her man as he waited for the third time to die. Perhaps her reason for leaving Florida was illness in the family, but she never came back. Initially, the November 18th date didn't seem as threatening as the July date had been, even though Ted was coming uncomfortably close to his slow walk to the electric chair. The public was simply getting used to Ted Bundy's execution dates. Maybe Ted was, too. Vernon Bradford, a spokesman for Florida State's Correction Department, said that Ted began the day in a very good mood. He watched television and listened to a radio place Dennis cell door, the holding cell just thirty paces from the death chamber. He was confident. Ted betrayed no fear at all. Rather, witnesses said he was mad, incensed, but he didn't seem scared. It was as if he was outraged that anyone could do this to the Ted Bundy.
Maybe everyone involved, including Ted, knew that it was far from over. He seemed to consider the preparations for executions as a charade, an inconvenience, and a deliberate humiliation. As the long Tuesday dragged by, Ted's confidence slipped, and he got angrier and more agitated. However, when one of his new wave of friends, John Tanner, a Florida criminal defense attorney and a spiritual counselor to Ted, visited him that night, he found Ted calm. There was a peace about him. Ted knew he wasn't going to die. Back in Seattle, I wasn't as comfortable about Ted's escape hatch as he apparently was. CBS Morning News called to say they had a limousine waiting to rush me to the Seattle affiliate station, Cairo. They wanted to interview me at 7 a.m. if Ted was executed. At 1 a.m., they called to say the execution was off. I was vastly relieved. I would not have stopped the execution if I could have, but I was quite willing to have it postponed, accepting only vaguely that, when the time really came, if it ever did, I would have emotions yet unfathomable to deal with. In November 1986, the pressure was off again. The spring of 1987 brought a small rash of articles about Ted. Millard Farmer, of the Atlanta Defense Team, speaking in Portland, Oregon, at the Oregon Criminal Defense Lawyers Association, discussed the Bundy case with an Oregonian reporter. Either Bundy didn't commit the crimes, or he's suffering from one of the deepest mental illnesses I have ever seen, Farmer said. Farmer said it was relatively common for the mentally ill to receive death sentences in the Old South. Farmer also blasted the media in the courtroom. Television makes clowns out of the lawyers, jesters out of the judges, and injustice out of the proceedings. Farmer said that the judges and witnesses in the Chi Omega trial had preened before going into court and would rush to the press room in the ninth floor of the Metro Justice Building in Miami to see how they looked on television. That wasn't true. I was there on the ninth floor in the summer of 1979, and Millard Farmer was not there. At least, I never saw him. Nor did I see a judge or lawyer there with us on the press floor looking at television. One time I saw Larry Simpson for the state, combing his hair before his opening agreement but he wasn't preening. Tut's correspondence continued to flood the Rayford prison mail room with letters for him. In April 1987, the Associated Press reported that Ted and John Hinckley, the would-be assassin of President Reagan and White House Press Secretary James Brady, had exchanged a number of letters. Hinckley had written to Ted to express sorrow about the awkward position you must be in. The pen pal arrangement was enough to cancel a proposed frolong for Hinckley, who had also written to Lynette Squeaky Frome. Frome had allegedly asked him to write to Charles Manson. Hinckley reportedly declined to write to Manson, but he had gone so far as to obtain Manson's address. I have always considered that John Hinckley was legally and medically insane. In the years since I wrote the first draft of this book where I stated that I thought Ted Bundy was insane, my subsequent research and enlightenment have convinced me that Ted was never psychotic. But how Ted would have relished with his correspondence with John Hinckley. It would have given him a chance to explore his own studies of the criminal mind, and I'm sure he thought his credentials as an expert on multiple and serial murder would be greatly enhanced by an inside track to Hinckley. But there was more. Ted's research into the reasons behind serial murder was fueled, I think, by his own desperate need to figure out what was wrong with himself. He knew full well he was not insane, but he also sensed there was something deeply apparent in his actions, although he didn't know what or why. One thing is clear, Ted never wrote to anyone or granted interviews to anyone without having reasons, payoffs, or hidden agendas. By the summer of 1987, Ted Bundy was no longer front-page news in the Northwest papers, except during the week preceding each new execution date. The Green River Killer had supplanted Ted. On July 7, 1987, an old picture of Ted appeared in the local region section of the Seattle Post-Intelligencer. The article suggested that Ted would be around for years, possibly for decades. He really is in the infancy of his litigation, Carol Snurkowski, Chief of Criminal Appeals for the Florida Attorney General, explained. She estimated that Ted was probably no more than one-third of the way along the route to conclusion. If that were to be translated into time in direct proportion, then Ted, who have already survived eight years beyond his first sentences of death, would live sixteen more, until he was fifty-seven years old. That formula was probably simplistic, but then, Governor Bob Graham had been defeated in his bid for re-election, and Ted Bundy's name, in continuing survival, 
were subjects raised often in the gubernatorial and attorney general races in Florida. If Graham couldn't seem to sign a death warrant that would stick, perhaps his successor, Bob Martinez, could. Just four of the hundreds of prisoners in Florida's death row had survived three death warrants. Sixteen men had been executed since 1979. There was no other prisoner who evoked rage and frustration in the citizens of Florida the way Bundy did. For many of them, he was no longer a human being. He was a cause. The first day of August in 1987 brought sad news to all of us who covered Ted's Miami trial. With bleakly ironic timing, Judge Edward Douglas Cowart, 62, suffered a heart attack exactly eight years and one day after he had sentenced Ted Bundy to die for the Chi Omega murders. On July 31, 1979, Judge Cowart had told Ted to take care of yourself. On Saturday, August 1, 1987, Judge Gerald Wetherington, who succeeded Cowart as the Chief Judge of the 11th Judicial Court in 1981, called Cowart to discuss some routine court business and found him in good health and great spirits. Ed Cowart then went out to work in his yard. Overheated, he came in for some cold water and suffered chest pains. His family took him to the Coral Reef Hospital, more as a precaution than anything. The husky coward was first put into intensive care, but was then moved to a private room. It seemed that nothing was seriously wrong. Tests were scheduled for Monday morning, but Ed Cowart died suddenly Sunday night of a massive heart attack. His death was a tremendous professional and personal loss to the judicial system of Southern Florida. Flags flew at half-mast outside the Metro Justice Building on Monday morning, as co-workers whispered the sad news that spread like wildfire throughout the building. Judges cried along with the secretaries and bailiffs. Ed Cowart was the kind of judge who always tempered hard justice with his personal compassion. When he had had to send the policeman to jail for perjury, bribery, and weapons convictions, he'd granted the rogue cop a two-week delay before starting his sentence, because the man had promised his little girl he'd taken her to Disneyland. Cowart's May God Have Mercy on Your Soul admonitions to condemned killers always sounded as sincere as a preacher's sermon on Sunday morning. I can still hear him saying, bless your heart, to both Ted and the attorneys from both sides of that trial ten years ago. He was a good man. Cowart left his wife of forty-one years, Elizabeth, and two daughters, Susan and Patricia. Judge Cowart, who had no history of illness, was dead. Ted Bundy, who had his life threatened for eight years, was alive and well and liable to stay that way. The new legal fight was about to begin. James Coleman and Polly Nelson had hinted for some time that they might attack the verdicts from the angle of Ted's mental competency. It now looked as if there would be a new thrust in this long process. It made some kind of sense when they said it out loud. Ted Bunny couldn't have had fair trials because he wasn't in his right mind as they were going on. That was the next campaign to keep Ted from the electric chair. While Polly Nelson and Jim Coleman put forth their theories that Ted had been incompetent during the Kimberly Leach trial, the Florida Attorney General's office prepared to argue for the other side. They felt Ted had been sane, competent, and capable throughout all his trials. Indeed, he had defended himself as an attorney in the Miami trial. He had managed to legally marry Carol Ann Boone during the Orlando trial. He had seemed sane. Early in October 1987, I received a call from the Florida Attorney General's office. Assistant Attorney Generals Kurt Bark and Mark Meinzer asked if I would consent to being an expert witness for the state of Florida in the matter of Ted Bundy's competency at the time of his trials in 1979 and 1980. I thought back to the time in 1976 when Ted weighed the possibility of having me testify as a character witness for him. I could not have done that, and luckily he chose to ask someone else. Now I was being sought by the other side. Competency is always a dicey judgment call. Even a psychiatrist cannot truly say what was in the mind of a killer at the moment of a crime, or during trial. It was true that I had been in continual contact with Ted from September 1975 through the Miami trial, a vital four-year period, and I had known him for years before that. The last time I had actually talked with him in any depth was, of course, his collect phone call to me in late June early July of 1979. His mind was cooking along as smoothly as computer software at that point, and watching him in trial, I had seen a man in exquisite control. I could testify to my perceptions. That was all. If I had to say yes, if Ted was deemed retroactively incompetent, 
Kimberly Leach verdict, possibly the Chi Omega verdicts, would probably be voided and new trials ordered. There would be a very real threat that Ted Bundy could work his way back through all his legal thickets, back to Colorado where the state had rather iffy physical evidence in the Karen Campbell murder case, and possibly even back to Utah. If his attorneys were skilled enough, and if luck was with Ted, he might find himself at Point of the Mountain again, with only the sentence of the attempted kidnapping of Carol Durant to serve out. Incredible as it seemed, Ted's life and times in the court systems of America had proved to be almost mythic. He was alive still, and that alone suggested he might be eerily indestructible. I agreed to testify in Florida in Ted's competency hearing. At that moment, I realized that I would have to be in the same courtroom with Ted, as I told a judge that he should not be allowed to avoid penalty for his crimes because I believed him competent. What an unsettling thought that was. Ted would be furious. But then he had been angry at me before. My value to the team was, essentially, that I had known him when. I had no choice. I received the contract from the Florida Department of Legal Affairs. It asked me to appear on my birthday, October 22, 1987. The department is representing the Department of Corrections, Richard L. Duggar, in the case of Bundy v. Duggar, and requires expert services for assessing Theodore Bundy's competency at the time of his trial and providing expert testimony at trial, and Miss Ann Rule is willing and able to provide needed testimony in this regard. Now, therefore, the parties agree as follows. The contract was ten pages long, and moot. I never had to sign it. In the last analysis, they didn't need me to prove that Ted Bundy was sane and competent. The competency hearing proceeded in Orlando during the third week of October, before U.S. District Judge G. Kendall Sharp, but without any testimony from Ted. Polly Nelson said that his current state of competency would be relevant only if a new trial should be ordered. Mike Minerva, one of Bundy's earlier attorneys, testified that Ted had insisted on directing his own defense. Minerva stayed on to help him, tried to get psychiatric help for his client, and was rebuffed. He said talking to most psychiatrists is no better than talking to truck drivers. Would you say Mr. Bundy was qualified to represent himself? Jim Coleman asked. No, sir, Minerva said evenly. I would say he was not qualified to represent himself. He couldn't do it. The amount of evidence was staggering. To try to conduct a defense in those two cases simultaneously, given the complexity and details, required a staff of lawyers with full access to investigators and law books. To do both from a jail cell with no investigator and no law books was impossible. No one could have done it. A paradox. My Nirva testifying for Bundy, who must have been an ultimately frustrating client. Ted had called Minerva incompetent because he wouldn't allow Ted to call the shots. Now Minerva was trying to save him. Ted was in the courtroom in Orlando, listening. He wore a blue and white striped sports shirt and white pants. His wavy hair was close-cropped, but the short cut didn't hide the gray hair that wasn't there seven years earlier. The question of Ted's competency would drag on for months. Testimony in December was more interesting. Donald R. Kennedy, an investigator for the Public Defender's Office, and former Public Defender Michael Corrin, testified that Ted had been drunk and otherwise compromised at the trial in the murder of Kimberly Leach. Ted had frequently used pills and alcohol during the trial, according to witnesses. Kennedy said that the alcohol had been discovered in a juice can that had been doctored up and provided by Ted's then fiance, Carol Ann Boone. Corrin said the juice cans with flip tops had been in the defense office. Kennedy testified that he had found one or two pills in a bag of goodies, brought to Ted during trial. If Ted chose to cloud his mind with drugs and alcohol while he was on trial for his very life, he showed, at least, a lack of judgment. One wonders why Carol Ann would help him do that. Assistant State Attorney Bob Deckel, who prosecuted Ted in 1980, differed from the defense team's recall. If there had been any doubt that Mr. Bundy was incompetent to stand trial, I would have made a motion to that effect. Deckel told Judge Sharp that he had found Ted to be reasoned, articulate, and persuasive in presenting legal arguments and carefully orchestrated defense efforts to sway the leech jury. His wedding to Carol Ann in court wasn't crazy at all. Deckel found it to be a failed attempt to gain sympathy from the jury. Ted Bundy had the ability to pull new supporters continually to him, like so many rabbits out of a magician's top hat. 
Art Norman, the forensic psychiatrist who spent countless hours with Ted in Florida, and who now practices in Oregon, commented to me in January 1989, I have never encountered an individual who could move from one relationship to the next so easily. Being seemingly deeply involved with someone and then dropping them completely and moving on. Norman hadn't wanted to talk to Ted in the first place. The first time he met with Ted, the experience was so jolting that he came home and cried. His wife and family didn't want him to be involved, but he finally agreed to work with Ted. Ted would often tell Norman details, but no names, of what were surely his crimes. He would say, You guess. Norman wouldn't play the game with this prisoner, who was obsessed with Nazis and torture. He was devastated for a week after seeing Friday the 13th, Norman recalls. The Slice and Dice movie stimulated Ted to the point that he was almost out of control. Eventually, like all those Ted was close to, Art Norman pulled away. And now, in December 1987, a new voice was heard from. Dorothy Ott, now Lewis, 51 a professor at the New York University Medical Center, educated at Radcliffe and Yale, happened to be studying juveniles on Florida death row. She was asked by Bundy's defense team to meet with him and evaluate him. Lewis testified that she had spent seven hours talking with Ted himself, had read boxes of legal and medical documents from his past, interviewed most of his relatives, and now had a diagnosis. Lewis felt that Ted was a manic depressive, subject to drastic mood swings. Another term for this disorder used in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, DSM-3, the Bible of Psychiatrists, is bipolar disorder. Subjects can be bipolar disorder mixed, with periods of both elation and depression, bipolar disorder manic, with only the highs, or bipolar disorder depressed, with only the lows. Once thought to be a rare disorder, manic depression is now rather widespread and occurs with varying degrees of severity. Lithium is the drug of choice to treat manic depression. Ted Bundy, to my knowledge, has never been a judged manic depressive before. Was he? I don't know, but I doubt it. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. Charles Mutter disagreed with Dr. Lewis. His arguments were brilliant. He is brilliant. He has defied and beaten three death warrants. Is that insanity? Whether Dr. Lewis had diagnosed Ted's mental disorder correctly or not, she did, however, present testimony that I found fascinating. Ted had told me about his grandfather, Sam Cowell of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This was the grandfather, who Ted told me he thought was his father for much of the early part of his life. Ted and Luis, of course, lived with the elder Cowells, Sam and Eleanor, for the first four and a half years of his life. The grandfather Ted described to me at the crisis clinic so long ago was a Santa Claus kind of grandfather. Ted clearly adored him, or so he recalled him to me. When Luis brought Ted out to Tacoma in 1951, Ted said he had been torn away from Grandfather Sam, and he missed him terribly. Indeed, Ted also told Dr. Lewis that his grandfather was wonderful, loving and giving, and that all his memories were favorable. The Grandfather Sam that Dr. Lewis described after interviews with family members, not including Luis Bundy, was a volatile, maniacal man. Sam Cowell, a talented, workaholic landscaper, allegedly terrorized his family with temper tantrums. He was the sort of breadwinner whose house comings sent his family scattering for shelter. He shouted and ranted and raved. His own brothers feared him, and reportedly muttered that somebody should kill him. His sister, Virginia, thought him crazy. Sam Cowell was described as a bigot who made Archie Bunker look liberal. He hated blacks, Italians, Catholics, Jews. And Cowell was sadistic with animals. He grabbed any cat that came near him and swung it by the tail. He kicked the family's dogs until they howled in pain. A church deacon, Sam Cowell was said to have kept a large collection of pornography in his greenhouse. Some relatives said that Ted and a cousin sneaked in there to pour over the pulp magazines. Since Ted was only three or four, that may be a creative memory talking. Or it may be true. The picture emerging from Lewis's testimony on Ted's grandmother, Eleanor, was that of a timid, obedient wife. Sporadically, she was taken to hospitals to undergo shock treatment for depression. In the end, Grandma Eleanor stayed home, consumed with agoraphobia, fear of open places, afraid to leave her own four walls lest some unknown disaster should overtake her. There were three daughters born to this ill-matched pair. Louise was the eldest, and then Audrey, 
and ten years later, Julia. This, then, had been the household where Ted Bundy spent his first, vital, formative years, the years when a child grows a conscience. For fourteen years I have wondered if there was not something more to know about Ted's childhood, something beyond his illegitimate birth, beyond his mother's deception, if indeed Ted was even telling me the truth about that, something traumatic back in Philadelphia. It finally spilled out in Dr. Lewis's testimony in Orlando. When Louise Bundy discovered she was pregnant, seduced by that shadowy man whose real identity grows more blurred with every year that passes, she must have been terrified. More than most families in 1946, hers would not welcome a bastard grandchild. Her church failed her. She was ostracized by her Sunday school group. One can only imagine her father's reaction. Her mother must have wept and crept still further into herself. Louise went off to Burlington, without her family, and gave birth to a husky baby boy. And then she went home, leaving Ted behind. Ted waited in the Elizabeth Lund home for three months while his mother agonized over what she would do. Could she take him home to Philadelphia? Should she put him up for adoption? The nurturing, cuddling, the bonding, so necessary to an infant's well-being, was put on hold. He was only a tiny baby, but I think he knew. It was not Louise Cowell Bundy's fault. I have always maintained that she did the best she could. With the new information coming from Dr. Lewis's testimony, it is obvious she did the best she could under horrendous circumstances. But she brought little Ted Bundy, a sensitive, brilliant little boy, into a household dependent on the whims of a tyrannical patriarch. The fact that Ted Bundy could never remember his grandfather as anything less than a kindly, wonderful man indicates, I think, just how frightened Ted was. He must have repressed all those emotions, virtually wiping out normal responses. He survived, but I think his conscience died back then, a casualty of Ted's flight from terror. Part of him closed off before he was five years old. Some of the relatives recall that Sam and Eleanor Cowell said they had adopted the baby boy in 1946. Adults in the family didn't believe such a story. Eleanor was too ill to be cleared as an adoptive parent. They all knew the child was Louise's, but no one talked of it out loud. That might well substantiate the story that Ted told me. He believed, at least for a time, that Sam and Eleanor were his parents. I know he did. He was so intense and disturbed when he said he never really knew who he was, or whom he belonged to. The fact that Ted was damaged early on comes out in the most telling incident that Dr. Lewis related in Ted's December 1987 competency hearing. It occurred when Ted was three years old. His Aunt Julia, then about fifteen, awakened from a nap to find that her body was surrounded by knives. Someone had placed them around her as she slept. She wasn't cut, but the glitter of the blades made Julia's heart convulse. Julia recognized that the knives had come from the cutlery drawer in the kitchen, and she looked up to see her three-year-old nephew. The adorable, elfin Ted Bundy stood by her bed, grinning at her three years old. Thirty-eight years later, Ted sat in Judge Sharp's courtroom and listened with equanimity as Dr. Lewis described his fearsome childhood. He was relaxed, even affable, as he chatted with his attorneys. Next, prosecutors played a videotape of the courtroom rhetoric Ted employed in February of 1980, after a jury had found him guilty of abducting and murdering 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach. The younger Ted on the flickering screen seemed anything but crazy as he strutted before Judge Wallace Jopling in Orlando. I was not convicted by the jury, Ted argued. A publicity-created symbol was convicted. I bear none of the onus. I bear none of the responsibility. I did not kill Kimberly Diane Leach. Ted smiled slightly at his image. Despite how he blamed the media for metamorphosing him into a symbol, He'd already proven early in this day that he still loved the cameras. As he was led from jail to the security van that would take him to the Orlando courthouse, Ted had spotted the cameras. With a grin, he wheeled and nimbly turned a backward somersault into the waiting van. Judge Kendall Sharp, white-haired, jet-jawed, naval reserve, and no nonsense about him, ruled on Ted's competency on December 17, 1987. Sharp was swift, impatient, and firm. Sharp was convinced that Ted had been fully competent during the Leach trial. I consider that Mr. Bundy was one of the most intelligent, articulate, coherent defendants I have ever seen. He added that Bundy was a very self-assured individual, 
who was well acquainted with legal procedures. Whenever Bundy presented legal arguments, he did so cogently, logically, and coherently. Sharp said this was never more true than Ted's arguments against the imposition of the death penalty on the last day of trial, February 12, 1980. The tab was getting steeper. Florida Attorney General Bob Butterworth's office computed the total bill for the state's legal battles against Ted Bundy had reached six million. There was no end in sight. Judge Sharp could see appeals going on and on. I could be seeing him for the rest of my life. Or his. It would be far more economical to keep Ted in prison than for the state of Florida to keep dashing through the minefields of legal battles. It cost $33.70 a day to keep an inmate behind bars, including meals, laundry, prison maintenance, guard salaries, and other costs. If Ted, 41, should live to be 80, it would cost approximately 492000 to keep him alive. The majority of the people of Florida seem not to care. They wanted the state to enforce the death penalty, whatever it might cost. Thirty days after Judge Sharp's ruling, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld his decision that Ted was competent during the Kimberly Leach trial. And then began a strangely quiet year. Legal maneuverings were surely taking place, but not in the headlines. It was easy not to think about Ted Bundy. Bob Keppel thought about him. Indeed, Keppel flew to Florida and had a second meeting with Ted in February of 1988. Reporters never picked up on that. Their dialogue and correspondence continued. One person who thought about Ted continually, obsessively perhaps, was Eleanor Rose, Denise Neslin's mother. Eleanor could not bury her daughter in the pink casket she had purchased back in 1974. Denise's remains were still lost. She had been allowed to borrow Denise's bones in 1974 to place them in the casket for a religious memorial service but they had to be returned to the police evidence area. And now they were gone. In December of 1987, Miss Rose and other family members won an unspecified amount in damages in an out-of-court settlement from the country over the loss of Denise's remains. Shortly after that, officials at Yarrington's funeral home in West Seattle suggested that Eleanor might want to think about burying the casket. They had stored it for 13 years. Rose, 50, looked two decades older. She seemed to survive on the need to avenge Denise's death, nothing more. On March 30, 1988, Eleanor placed a collection of mementos into a pink coffin. Denise's favorite floral print dress, a poem, a pink silk rose, photographs of Eleanor and Denise, a rosary, a crucifix, and a note. Dear Denise, God forgive them for what they have done. I love you. She didn't say he, she said they. Eleanor did not explain what she meant to reporters. A short item appeared under paid notices funerals in the Seattle Times and the Post Intelligencer. Denise Marie Nesland. Final memorial service will be on Wednesday, March 30th, 2 p.m., graveside committal at the Forest Lawn Cemetery, West Seattle. Denise died July 14, 1974. Her remains were recovered the following September. Rosary and Mass of Christian Burial were celebrated October 10, 1974, at Holy Family Church. She is the daughter of Eleanor and Robert Nesland, sister of Brock Nesland, granddaughter of Olga Hansen, all Seattle. Arrangements, Harrington's Funeral Home. I went back to Florida for the first time in many years in July 1988. I was on a promotion tour for my book, Small Sacrifices. Eight years had passed since I'd been in Miami and Tampa, St. Petersburg, Although interviewers wanted to talk about Diane Downs, the murderess and small sacrifices, they never failed to ask questions about Ted Bundy. Odd, somehow, that his impact had faded in the Northwest while he was a living, breathing reality in Florida. In Orlando, the site of the Leach trial in 1980, I appeared in a bizarre early morning show, The Q Zoo. It was a radio station where the show consisted of a disc jockey playing records and greeting guests. It was the definitive wild and wacky radio show. Fairly standard, except that the entire program was televised at the same time it was broadcast over radio. This was the station that had popularized the sound of frying bacon sizzling, to remind listeners that Bundy should fry. An entire cassette caddy was filled with Bundy parodies. While I was the morning guest, the host dedicated songs to Ted. I wonder if he was listening. He might well have been. We're not far from Rayford Prison. Once again, just as he had been in Colorado, 
Ted Bundy was a macabre kind of folk hero, or anti-hero. It may have been that his crimes were so heinous that no one could bear to stop and reflect on their reality. And so they laughed. I could never see anything funny about what Ted had done. The best I had been able to muster was to occasionally see the black irony in his saga. But here in Orlando, on July 19, 1988, the sun already beat hot on the pavement at 8 a.m. The radio blasted out. Hang down your head, Ted Bundy. Hang down your head and cry. Hang down your head, Ted Bundy. Poor boy, you're bound to die. Part of me wanted to lean toward the microphone and say, Ted, this isn't me playing this song. I just happen to be here to plug my book. I said nothing. Being a Bundy biographer meant having to listen to sick Bundy jokes. Throughout the summer and fall of 1988, there were short little columns of information on Ted. Mostly the headlines began, Bundy loses an appeal. I think those of us who followed the case were almost serveted on the sort of news. It was growing hard to follow, from circuit court to federal appeals court to the U.S. Supreme Court. I remember saying to a young Florida assistant AG, It almost seems as though Ted can take one issue all the way to the Supreme Court, and it gets turned down, and then he can find another issue and start all over again. You got it, he said succinctly. 